coming up on this episode of Crime Family. The Natalie Holloway case, and it's almost, it's coming up almost like 20 years ago when this actually happened, but there's just so much out there. It's so interesting to talk about. On the morning of May 30th, 2005, everyone was supposed to meet at the airport. Natalie just wasn't there and hadn't gotten in touch with anyone. There's reports that the key card to Natalie's room was used three times between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. on the morning that she had gone missing. So this would have been like the prime time where something would have happened to her in those hours. When Joran said that he dropped her off, but he probably didn't really drop her off. Something happened in those hours, but her key card was being used during this time. It's not necessarily that he like took her to that beach in order to kill her. But it just happened, however it happened, and then he covered it up, which is obviously still wrong, but I could see that being a scenario. Hey everyone, welcome to Crime Family. So today we're going to talk about the Natalie Holloway case. And I know that this case has gotten a lot of coverage and it's almost, it's coming up almost like 20 years ago when this actually happened, but there's just so much out there. It's so interesting to talk about. And because it's still unsolved, I think that it's still important to get the story out there. So, um, cause you just never know what could be uncovered. So Steph and I are going to talk about this case. Um, yeah, here we I go. I feel like, I feel like wasn't this case, if my memory is correct, it's almost like a case that feels like it's weird to think that it was unsolved. It is unsolved because I feel like I, it used, it went from being potentially solved. Oh, they know who might've done it. Oh, and then back to, no, it's actually not solved. And then like kind of went back and forth many times. Yeah. Um, you you will find out that throughout this case, there are lots of ups and downs. It seems like they were close or it seems like it was solved. But then in the end, we really still are left with questions. So, okay. So Natalie was born on October 21st, 1986 in Memphis, Tennessee. And she was the oldest of two. So she also had a younger brother named Matt. Uh, Dave and Beth Holloway are Natalie's parents. Dave was working in insurance and Beth worked in the school system. But unfortunately, their marriage did not last long and they ended up getting divorced in 1993. Natalie and her brother Matt were mostly raised by their mother and then Beth remarried in the early 2000s to a man named George Jug Twitty and then she went by Beth Holloway Twitty. Natalie was very close to her mother and her stepfather. They moved to Mountain Brook, Alabama when Natalie was just in junior high and they lived in the upper class community called Mountain Brook and Natalie thrived there. She easily fit in at her school and had lots of friends. She was outgoing and happy. She tried out for the dance team at her school and she made it every year. In high school she was a straight-A student and had a full-time scholarship to the University of Alabama where she had plans to become a doctor. She really did have everything going for her, and her whole life was still ahead of her. In 2005, when Natalie was 18, she graduated from high school and was celebrating with over 100 of her classmates with a trip to Aruba. Her graduation was the last time her father would ever see her. So Natalie's father, Dave, recalls Natalie asking him to pay for half of the trip to Aruba, and he did, but what he didn't realize at the time was that the drinking age in Aruba was 18, and this may have made him more reluctant if he had known that, because as we all know in the States, the drinking age is 21. But obviously, since the drinking age was 18 in Aruba, Natalie was 18, there really wouldn't be any obstacles to her buying alcohol and being able to 
party the entire time she was there, which probably would have been the case anyway, even if she wasn't of legal drinking age, because there, obviously it's very easy to get around those kind of things, especially in a place that's you know very catered towards that kind of lifestyle and the tourism that it brings in. Natalie's parents were both really reluctant at first to send her on this trip. They do eventually um, give in. So it's reported by multiple sources that according to her uncle, Paul Reynolds, Natalie really wasn't a big partier. She hadn't dated a lot and she was very naive. So that makes me think that she would have been very trusting of anyone, maybe wouldn't have had her guard up as much as she should have. And you know, maybe she really decided that she was going to let loose for the first time, maybe drink more than she ever had. So that, you know, she's graduating, celebrating. So, you know, why wouldn't you kind of let go a little bit? As Steph said, she was a straight A student. So she obviously worked really hard. So this was her chance to kind of let go. And I totally get it because I feel like a lot of us have been there doing that kind of thing. Um, So this trip to Aruba had become a yearly event for the graduating class at Mountain Brook High School, where Natalie went. And Natalie's stepbrother had actually gone on the same trip two years prior to Natalie in 2003. And he had brought up just one troubling thing from his trip. So Beth, Natalie's mother, tells Chris Hansen from NBC News that her stepson says that he had been out to a bar called Carlos and Charlie's, and there was a group of locals that had coaxed some of the girls out of the bar and were trying to convince them to leave with them. But her stepson stepped in before they actually did have a chance to leave, just because he had a bad feeling about the situation. He didn't think that some of these local boys should be taking these intoxicated drunk girls away from the bar to do whatever. And so he was able to step in. But anyway, despite everything, all the information, their parents kind of being hesitant about it, they do let Natalie go to Aruba with this huge group. So like when you think about it, she's going with at least 100 kids. I think even some sources say like 125, maybe 130 kids were all going on this trip. So as a parent, you kind of think that there's this sense of comfort, like safety in numbers kind of thing. But with that many people, it's impossible to keep track of everybody's whereabouts. And it's really easy for people to think that someone else is kind of looking out for other people or somebody else knows where another person is if you don't, that kind of thing. And there was about seven, I think, chaperones that were there, but their job wasn't really to like keep tabs on every person. Their job was to kind of do a head count every day just to make sure that everybody was still at their hotel and everybody was still accounted for every day. But 125 people is a lot of people to keep track of. So Natalie was so excited to spend some time on her vacation with her friends. Their trip was planned to be a five-day long trip, so from May 25th to May 30th of 2005. So while they were on vacation, they did a lot of drinking and partying, but they were just having like a good time. So like we've all been there. So that's what it was like for Natalie and her classmates. But things turned from having a great time to Natalie not showing up for her flight home and everyone panicking. So on the morning of May 30th of 2005, everyone was supposed to meet at the airport to fly back to Alabama. When Natalie's flight time was getting close, Natalie just wasn't there and hadn't gotten in touch with anyone to let them know where she was or if she was going to be late. Or anything like that. Friends became worried. But just initially thought they were just simply. There was was a simple explanation. Maybe she overslept or was running late. And so her friend decides to go back to the hotel where Natalie was staying. And she found no signs of Natalie. But her backpack and all of her personal belongings was still there in the hotel. That's when panic set in. Friends called Beth. Natalie's mother. Within 12 hours, Beth arrived in Aruba. I feel like I remember reading something about about this case. Like, wasn't all of her stuff packed and, like, neatly ready to go? As if, like, she had, like, packed it the night before or something. And, like, her passport was, like, there. I feel like that's what I remember reading about it. It wasn't, like... Like, she had been preparing to go, obviously. Like, everything was ready to leave. Yeah. I, I remember there was some sources that were saying it was as if she had packed up everything and then was planning just to come like come back to her room and pick up her stuff before she had to go. So it wasn't like everything was everywhere. It was like neatly packed up. 
Yeah, okay. And But also, were they not all staying in the same hotel? Like, so, so some of her friends went to the hotel she was staying at? Was- yeah, so from I don't know where everyone was staying. It was probably maybe hard to get like 125 people all into one hotel. Yeah, um, that's true. But I do know that there was multiple hotels, like just in a strip along the beach. There was like the Holiday Inn, there was the Marriott, there was the Radisson, there was like the Wyndham. Like those were all there. So I feel like they probably could have all been scattered around, but still all very close together. Beth recalls getting the phone call and she tells Chris Hansen from NBC News that she instantly knew something terrible had happened because that was so out of character for Natalie. Uh, she says, quote, I knew instantly when I received the call that just from Natalie's history and character and just her record, I knew instantly that she'd either been kidnapped or murdered. There was no hesitation. Absolutely none. Absolutely none. Unquote. So Natalie's father, Dave, recalls getting the phone call as well, and he tells Chris Hansen, quote, It hit me, and grown men don't usually cry, but I knew this is bad. I knew then that I was going to have to go to Aruba to find her, end quote. And he gets to Aruba on June 1st. So Beth and Jug Twitty actually hired a group of local Arubans to be their guides so they could help them navigate quickly and not waste time with directions and the language barrier. By the time she gets to Aruba, Natalie has already been missing for over 12 hours and she doesn't want to waste another second. There was a whole group of Alabama parents and family friends that had come out to help search for Natalie as well. They started to search for her and are asking people when they last saw Natalie to try and piece together her movements that night. Beth starts by asking friends and calling everyone that was with Natalie that night. So they actually start their search at the Holiday Inn where Natalie was staying. And when Beth and her group get to the Holiday Inn, they talk to the staff and they speak to a night manager. And almost right away, the night manager mentions someone by the name of Joran Vandersloot, who was a 17-year-old local. And they also talk to the casino manager of the casino that is attached to the hotel And it turns out that Natalie was in the casino the night that she disappeared, as they actually have surveillance footage of her, and they can clearly see Joran Vandersloot at the casino as well at the same table as Natalie. So one of Natalie's friends named Lorraine Watson remembers Joran hanging out with their group that night, but he says that he introduced himself as a 19-year-old tourist from Holland. And he hung out at the casino and then came with them when they all went to Carlos and Charlie's that night. So that's that same bar that I had mentioned earlier, Carlos and Charlie's, um, the one that Natalie's stepbrother said that all the locals were trying to coax the American girls to leave with them. So same bar, just a really popular place. So everyone that they're talking to seems to agree that the last known whereabouts of Natalie was at Carlos and Charlie's, and her friends say that she was last seen getting into a gray Honda Civic with a group of young men, and one of them was Yorin. But they all assumed that she was just getting a ride back to her hotel, because they said after the bar closed around 1am, they're a huge group of people, so there's probably like 60 of them at that bar, They were all outside trying to get cabs, and it was really chaotic. So when they saw Natalie get into that gray Honda with Yorin, who they had recognized from before, they probably just didn't think it was that alarming because everyone was just trying to get a ride home. Or everyone was just trying to get a ride back to their hotel. So at this point, Beth contacts the Aruban police, and the police accompany Beth to Yorin's house, the police start questioning Paulus Vandersloot, who is Joran's father, and Paulus calls Joran and tells him the police are at the house with a group of Americans asking where their daughter is. And Joran agrees to talk to them about his time with Natalie, so he does admit that he and his two friends, two brothers named Depeak and Satish Kalpo, they were all with Natalie that night. And things do start getting pretty heated between the Alabama group and Yorin and that's when Yorin offers to show everyone where they dropped Natalie off that night. So he goes on to say that they dropped her off in front of her hotel, the Holiday Inn, and when Natalie got out of the car, 
in front of her hotel. She had fallen down and hit her head, and that's when two security guards came over to help her. And Joran and his friends left. So Beth does try to file a missing persons report, but she was kind of brushed off by the Aruban police because they say people go missing all the time in Aruba and that she was probably um, show, she would probably just show up in a few days. And of course, you can imagine how frustrating this would have been for Beth and everybody else. They knew Natalie. They knew that that wasn't her style. Like she's not just going to leave without telling anybody just to go party for a couple extra days. So they are able to get a hold of the video surveillance from the Holiday Inn a few days later, but the video surveillance footage does not show Natalie making it back to the hotel that night. She's nowhere to be seen on those tapes, but it does become clear pretty quickly that Yorin, Depeak, and Satish cannot get their story straight about what happened that night. If you're going to lie um, or, you know... If you're gonna lie or make up a story to the police it's like at least maybe get it right between your, yourselves first <laughs> like maybe make sure all yeah. three of you are telling the same story or however many of you are telling the same story i know well i think we'll get into this a little bit but they do kind of have a conversation about what they're going to tell the police but they're probably just didn't have those little details together enough to be like this is what happened because they were each maybe filling in things differently. So, yeah. Like they had a broad story, but then when the police ask very specific questions about little things, they like, oh shit, didn't yeah, think about this. Yeah, it falls apart very quickly. Yeah. 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 So a little bit about Joran. Um, Joran was born in 1987 in the Netherlands, but moved to Aruba with his family only three years after he was born. So he basically grew up there and was considered a local. Joran was known for hitting on American girls and he would often bring them back to his hotel room to have sex parties with his friends. But a lot of this is just speculation from the locals who knew Joran. He was a very confident and headstrong teenager that was used to getting what he wanted. His father, Paulus Vandersloot, was a prominent attorney on the island who was, who was training to become a judge. This is another one of those cases that got a lot of media attention initially. When the media frenzy started, Beth was doing a ton of press coverage in hopes that someone knew anything about the night of May 30th or any other details that might lead them to Natalie. Early on in the investigation, Beth's father also recalls that the police tells him not to worry about Natalie and that she'll probably show up in a couple of days. They say that a lot of girls that come to the island get in touch with a drug dealer and go on drug binges for a few days miss their flights but eventually they do end up back home i mean how like how is that not concerning enough for police to at least try to search for her an 18 year old on a drug binge seems pretty serious i would think but of course dave knew that wasn't the case with natalie and he very quickly realized that him and his family would have to search for Natalie on their own for the most part. Even though like, they But knew- why would he say, like, sorry, but why would he say, like, is he is saying that to his parents? Like, oh, yeah, a lot of times they just get caught up with drug dealers. Go on drug binges. It'll be fine. Like, as, why would you say that and be, like, as an attempt to calm them down? Like, that's not going to calm anyone down. It's going to, like, make it worse. It's just weird that that would be and what they like, would use. I don't know. And it's not even, like, plausible because she was with, like, a hundred and... 20 other people so like if she was doing well, it drugs, is plausible but well it is but if she was doing drugs somebody in that group would have known or would have like said something you not think? necessarily because she disappeared and nobody knows what happened to her so she obviously was separated from everybody right but so if she, she was doing drugs like throughout the trip they would know or maybe i'm getting ahead of it but didn't people come forward and say that like she was drinking like excessively like there was reports that said something like they were all drinking but like they did notice that her drinking was a little bit more excessive or something like that. I feel like I heard, read that about this case. So it's like they would have also known if she was doing drugs too. But to be honest, like when I went to Quebec, I was 18. It was like the first time I ever really drank. And I got like, I drank excessively every night because I was like free. Like I was, nobody was really watching out for me. I was like no parents around. Like it was just, I felt like this independent person. Yeah, just... but I think they will. But I think they were all like, maybe they were all saying like, they were all drinking excessively, but like they made a point of noticing that hers was more excessive than everyone else's excessiveness. Yeah. Like, can, did I, you yeah, see that yeah. when you read this case? Or, like, I feel mm-hmm. like that's in there somewhere, right? Yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So 
a lot of people were saying, like I was saying before, that she really wasn't the partying type. So even if she didn't drink as much as other people, it would have affected her more because she didn't wasn't used to it. She hadn't built up that tolerance. So can you just think of like the first few times when you're drinking, how it just like hits you really fast, right? So this she may have been drinking more and then also she didn't have that tolerance of other people. So it was definitely affecting her more than a lot of the other people there. So it was definitely noticeable is the point, I think. Yeah, so that's all I was trying to like. But I was just trying to make the point of like they would have also noticed if she was doing drugs, wouldn't they? Like if they if they notice that she's drinking excessively, I feel like they would know that she was doing drugs. So like the fact that maybe she got caught up in a drug cartel or something, it went on a drug binge. Like people would know. I feel. Oh, but maybe I yeah. mean, like, I guess, well, you know, I feel I like if she, if she was doing drugs, the whole, remember this is a short trip, so I mean it's only been like four days, four nights so far, and they're only there for five days, so. If she was doing drugs the whole time, I feel like, yeah, it probably would have been really obvious because her behavior probably would have changed really quickly. But this could have been the last night. She was like, this is my... It does come up later that this was her last night in Aruba and she kind of wanted to savor it, like have as much fun as she could. And she didn't want to go back to her, her hotel room that night because it was her last night. So it was kind of like maybe her big, her last hurrah. And she could have gotten into something that she really never had done before. Who knows? But going back to what AJ said, you still don't tell you the parents of a missing child that oh she'll, she might show up in a few days she t- could just be out doing drugs like that's not gonna make the situation better like that's gonna I make think- them oh okay mm-hmm. sure we'll go back to our hotel and sit here yeah and wait till she comes back like as if yeah they probably were trying to be reassuring saying that this happens like people go missing but they always show up so don't think too much into it kind of thing even though saying she's probably out on a drug binge wasn't the best wording but they're probably just trying to be like, yeah, she'll show up because that's what happens all the time and everybody comes back. So, yeah. So even though they knew that this was very unlike Natalie, Jug Twitty actually tracks down some of the known drug houses looking for her, but didn't find any trace of her. ABC's 2020 reports that the investigation from the Aruban authorities was very slow going. The deputy chief at the time says that they had been working on every lead they have gotten they had searched Yoren's house and seized computers and cars and cameras to try and build an investigation but to the public and Natalie's family it may have looked like they weren't doing anything at all the authorities did say that they didn't want the group of people from Alabama getting involved the Alabama group was allegedly going around to all the bars and all the local places to try and track Yoren down to get some answers for, out of him. The police were also not happy that th- they were conducting their own searches, a lot of them disruptive to the tourists, because Aruba relies heavily on their tourism industry, so they didn't want to paint this island as, in a bad light, especially since early on they believed that Nally was just partying somewhere. So that may have made it look like they weren't supporting the search efforts when in fact they were just doing things on their own or their own way. They probably like they probably didn't want they didn't want the public looking at the police like, oh, like like she's like not doing anything, like put a bad like taste in the in the mouths and being like these police officers are like just don't care. So I could see kind of why they didn't want them doing that, but again, this is a mother and a father who's desperately looking for answers. And if the police aren't really doing anything, like, of course, they're going to try and do it on their own. Yeah. And I can see it from both both sides, because like when you're doing research on this and they're explaining like there's this whole like horde of people from Alabama that have come up, like I, all the whole community of like Mountain Brook, basically. And they're, when they all pulled up to like Yoren's house, it was like the cop car and like two vans just full of like angry parents yelling at Yoren and his father. So... You can see, and they're going around to the bars, just be like, where's Yorin? Like, you can see them, like, stomping through the streets. So you can see why the authorities would be like, you know, don't do that, for one thing. Like, we're doing our own thing. And you, just, and any investigation, I don't think you would want just this group of people that don't even live there, just, like, harassing the entire island. You can definitely see where they're coming from. But then also, of course, you see Natalie's parents. Let's get everybody we can involved out there looking. So it, it's both ways, and it just, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I do think it was a little bit of probably 
both because we obviously we've seen in many many cases where the police just don't take it seriously or whatever like that's a common theme that we've all seen by now in all of these cases we've covered but i think it's a little bit of like yeah maybe they're weren't taking it as seriously because yeah they're saying like oh it happens all the time they come home but then also on the other hand like there is a lot of stuff that happens in an investigation that like isn't known to the public so just because they're not coming out with anything doesn't mean that there's nothing happening and of course they're not going to sabotage the investigation by releasing information prematurely they want to make sure they have it all before they kind of go out with it so i think there might be a little bit of that and like just because we while you understand her parents side it's like yeah we want answers we need to know what happened but it's also like they might be following up on stuff that they're just not telling you but that doesn't mean that they're not doing it yeah exactly also to aruba's credit um there was reports that the government kind of let all the government employees off work for the day to go search the island so it was like they were trying to cooperate and help with the search but you have to remember that this is like a little small island that like their only econ that their whole economy is surrounded by like tourism so having this huge thing blow up that aruba's not safe for americans would probably cripple them like economically not that that's more important than the search but you can kind of see where they're coming from especially since like you said they think that she's off having a good time she'll be back so don't ruin our whole economy over a girl partying is what they thought yeah and i feel like people are so quick to jump on that like you know one case of somebody going missing and they're like oh look it's it's not safe like look what happens it's like meanwhile people are getting going missing on the streets of you know on the streets of major cities in the in U- the u.s and people don't think anything of it but the minute they go missing in a foreign country it's like well look it's not safe so i mean i do understand that part of it where they don't want that image to be on them yeah and also like i wasn't going to bring this up because it's super annoying but like dr phil got involved and he was all like um he was like yelling Fuck at him. The, no, he was yelling at the Rubens and he's like, if you guys don't take this seriously or something like that. And he's like, he's like, oh, the United States is going to boycott Aruba until Natalie comes home. And so he was like just threatening to like totally shut down their economy, which is like, first of all, who are you, Dr. Phil, to tell every American what to do? And second, like, just why? It's not like they weren't doing anything. It's just very different. You have to understand that. So, And it's just annoying. I know this is off topic. I just want to get it to say, could you imagine if it was the other way around? Like if a foreign country said that about America, like, oh, we're going to boycott America until you bring our, like, you know, they'd be fucking declaring war on that country. You know, like, it's just, it's annoying. Oh, yeah, I know. It just seems very entitled, right? For Dr. Phil to say that. Yeah. And like, yeah, also, yeah, like you said, who is Dr. Phil? He's the voice of America now. Like, give me a fucking break. I know. Yeah, it's not like she didn't deserve the attention, but it's like, that's not the right way to do it by, like, threatening the Aruban government to, you know, cripple them. So, anyway. Yeah. So, the first people to be arrested in this case were those two security guards that Jorn had implicated, saying that they had helped Natalie when she fell and hit her head that night. But once they looked into those two security guards, they were actually released on June 18th for having nothing to do with Natalie that night at all. Around 9 to 10 days into the search, Yorin, Depec, and Satish were arrested and were being held on possible charges of first or second degree murder and kidnapping resulting in death. So this is later on in the investigation, but she does do an in-depth interview um, with Fox News on in March of 2006. And this is kind of like the clearest picture we have so far of what Yorin's side of the story is. So... He goes into a lot of detail in this interview, but he says that he first meets one of Natalie's friends while playing poker at the casino, and it's this friend that had asked him to come out with them later that night to Carlos and Charlie's. So when he does show up to the bar, Carlos and Charlie's, there is a large group of Alabama students there, and they're all dancing, and when Natalie sees him, she asks him to dance, but he's not really much of a dancer, so he says no, but they go order drinks together instead. Yorin says that Natalie wasn't super drunk. He says that she knew what was going on. She knew what she was doing the whole time, even though she was drinking a lot. And I guess I think, you know, Yorin doesn't really know Natalie, so how would he know what she normally acted like? So that's not really, like, a good indicator of how she actually was. Um, Carlos and Charlie's closed at 1am that night, and Natalie leaves with Yorin, Topeak, and Satish. Some reports say that they do head to another bar that night, um, but the timeline is not completely solid. But Yorin does say that 
after the bar, after all the bars, they start to head over to his house, but they never actually do get there because on the way, Natalie decides that she wants to go watch sharks. And even though Yorin tells her that there are no sharks, they drive out to a nearby lighthouse along the coast, and eventually Yorin and Natalie get dropped off by the beach to to walk in the sand and watch the stars and just talk. So while, while they're like when they left the bar, Yorn and Natalie were kind of holding hands, talking, and in the back of the car, they were kind of like making out and they were close and just talking the whole time. So that's kind of the vibe of this whole night. Um, Yorn says that Natalie wanted him to stay with her the whole night on the beach because it was her last night in Aruba. She really loved it there and she wanted someone to kind of share the night with since she was going to be leaving the next day. Doran tells her that he had school early the next day because this was a Sunday night so he had school the next day it was a Monday and he really needed to go home and sleep and so he says that he calls the peak for a ride home and then Satish shows up in the gray Honda and Yoran doesn't even really say goodbye to Natalie he just leaves and that's the last time he ever saw her as if <laughs> so um another version of the story is that Yorin left Natalie there even though she was starting to fall asleep like in and out of sleep because she didn't want to go back to the hotel so he just so he left but I have like I have so many different thoughts about this scenario because like you don't just leave an uh, intoxicated person on the beach in a place they don't really know um where there could be potential potential for them to like fall into the water or drown like that's just, a, I don't know, that's not something you really do. Yorin admits it when he got the call from his dad that Natalie was missing. Is when he and Depeak decide to make up the story about them dropping Natalie off at the Holiday Inn. In case something did happen to her so they wouldn't be implicated. The investigation continued, but after a month of not having enough evidence to keep the Kelpo brothers, a judge ordered their release on July 4th. And their charges were dropped. Yorin is still in, in custody because he claims that the Kalpo brothers refused to tell the police that they dropped Yorin off at his house alone while Natalie was still on the beach. And because they refused to tell the police that, they still had a reason to keep Yorin in custody to further look into him. The Kalpo brothers are rearrested in August, but both of them and Yorin are released in early September of 2005 and then two years later all three of them are arrested again as new evidence is uncovered but again it's not enough to move forward so they all were released again Joran's father Paulus I'm was sorry that's a, that's annoying it's like yeah there was enough evidence there was enough evidence to arrest them but not enough evidence to keep them arrested so they had to release them like what's the like it's is what, there's either evidence or there isn't I don't understand yeah. So that's like the thing they say with like, there's kind of this pattern with the Aruban police. It's like a catch and release thing. It's like you catch them and you have to let them go because you don't have enough. And I think we think of like our justice system before you arrest somebody, you build a case and then you arrest them. Them, it's arrest them and then try to scramble and get all mm. the evidence so you can keep them. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of opposite. And I guess you can arrest them as many times as you need every time something comes up, it seems. But for us, it would be you know, don't arrest them for four years because we're building a case and then arrest them while they're the opposite. Yeah, Cause so it, Because it, wouldn't that tip them off then? Like, then they know that, like, you're on to them. They might have motivation to leave where they're at, leave the country. Like, oh, I was arrested again. Like, what's the stop? If I was arrested once, what's to stop them from arresting me again? So I feel like that just tips them off more than anything. It's more mm -hmm. dangerous to do that versus just... I mean, it is frustrating, too, where we can wait years and years to build a case. But then once you build the case and you have the evidence, then you know you have them versus like, yeah, I, I just seems I guess, weird. Especially if you don't. Yeah. So if you don't arrest somebody for four years, they kind of get this confidence while they're like, they're not going to catch me. And that's when they slip up. And then in this most case, people, I feel like, would assume that they're going to be caught within the first. If they're going to be caught, it's going to be within this so amount of time. So if you go years and years, you're like, OK, yeah, exactly. Might be in, the, in the clear. In this case, if they're already arrested, it's like, well, I'm already on their, their, you know, radar. So when I do get out, which I'm going to, um, I'm going to get rid of evidence. We're going to talk about this. So next time we get caught, we'll have a story straight. So that kind of thing. So it does seem kind of not, doesn't seem to work very well in this case. 
Yeah. yeah and, I, and I hate saying like things like, oh, they, they just do it. They don't do it as well as we or whatever, right? Like, I hate that. I'm not saying that. It's just in this instance, I can see how like waiting until you have something solid, it'd be the better strategy. Yeah, but this is obviously this is off topic again. But the way we do it here, someone could be out, and they for four years they could be out committing other crimes, while the police are trying to catch them for a different one. So it, it can it's definitely both ways have ups and downs, mm-hmm. good and bad. Yoren's father Paulus was also arrested after questioning in June, and so was a DJ of a party boat who was believed to have been involved. But they were both released on June twenty sixth. So during all of this, all of the arrests, Natalie's family's search is still ongoing. So in the early days, they search almost the entire island. They search the ponds, they search the beaches, they search the lighthouse, all through the town, but they come up with nothing. They start searching the, la- the nearby landfills and wells. And on October 21st, 2005, so this is Natalie's birthday, Dave her father was down in a well combing through garbage hoping to find natalie or any evidence anything at all to help bring her home and it was that day when he said that he was leaving aruba and he was never coming back because he was just thinking what a horrible way to spend your daughter's birthday of course him saying that wasn't true because he'd be back so many times after that you know trying to follow up on leads and just continuing the search but he was just very frustrated that day so that same day October 21st, 2005, a tip had come in that there was a a break-in in the fishermen's huts on the beach that Natalie was reported at with Yorin that night, and there was speculation that some of the items stolen could have been used to dispose of and weigh down a body at sea. And a man named Louis Schaefer steps up and offers his expertise of underwater exploration to the Holloway family free of charge because... Trying to find something on the ocean floor in an area so vast was very difficult. And so this was his way of helping out the family was, um, you know, doing this for free for them with all of his equipment, his staff and his expertise. But it wasn't until two years later in November of 2007 that they had finally gotten everything together. They made a plan about where they suspected Natalie's body would have been dumped. A man named Tim Miller, whose own daughter had been kidnapped and murdered decades earlier, had been involved from the search from the very from very early on. Um, He helped Dave search the wells and landfills, and he was dedicated to finding Natalie. So he was on that boat searching for her as well. On Christmas Eve 2007, Dave gets a call from Tim, who excitedly tells him that they found Natalie. He's 99.9% sure that it's her. And the underwater cameras had come across an old crab trap that looked like there was a human skull inside of it. And the Aruban authorities get involved as well. And on December 30th, a group of divers make their way down to the bottom of the ocean floor to inspect what they had found. So hopes are high. They think that maybe they finally figured out what happened to Natalie and they could bring her body home. But unfortunately, um, they did not discover what they were hoping for. Natalie had not been found. So that was a big letdown. And So whose skull was it? That's a good question. But I don't think it was actually a skull. I think it just kind of looked like human remains through like this camera through the water. Once they actually got down there, it wasn't that. Oh. So it seems very pr- pr- like presumptuous for Tim to be like, oh my god, we got her, when it wasn't even a human body. So too excited, very unfortunate. Another lead had come in around the same time from someone who wanted to stay anonymous, but he went by the name Marco. Um, and he told Dave that he had information about where Natalie's body could be found in Nicaragua. So his story was that someone had paid some drug runners to take Natalie's body and dump it in the ocean for whatever reason, they took it all the way to Nicaragua and disposed of it there. So this man said that he had done some bad things in his life and this was his way, like one of the things he could do to kind of help make up for that. And Tim Miller, who, like I said, was on that boat searching for Natalie, actually went to meet with Marcos and they did get together in Nicaragua. And the plan was for Marco to leave a GPS receiver on the spot where Natalie's body was buried. And then Tim Miller and the police would use that GPS signal to find and locate Natalie. 
So Marco tells him the next day that you know he says he found the body and that he was going to bring it to them rather than them coming to get it from him. And he said that she was wrapped in a blanket and that he that she had kind of like fallen apart when he took her out of the location. And so he put her in two ice chests and he would transport her that way. And, you know, poor Dave, Natalie's father, believed that this was it. He actually believed they had found Natalie and that she was coming home. But while they're waiting for Marco to bring her, he never shows up and they never hear from him again. And in the end, they kind of conclude that this was just probably a sick joke for whatever reason. This guy took it very far to the point where he just devastated this family all over again. What's wrong with people? I feel like I lose all faith in humanity when people are like that. I know. I hate hearing those kinds of stories. Like, why bother? Like, get a life. Like, it's just so annoying. I know. People will do anything to be relevant. (laughs) I know. Just a couple weeks after this devastating ordeal, the Holloways are notified by the Dutch authorities who are conducting an investigation of their own. They had planted hidden cameras during a conversation with Joran and a friend of his named Patrick. So Joran was actually telling Patrick that he had been with Natalie that night that she disappeared and that she had started shaking or convulsing really badly on the beach. And so he kind of panicked. And when he was confronted about this footage, he says that he was lying because he was on marijuana that night and he just wasn't thinking clearly. And prosecutors wanted to arrest him based on that footage but two judges actually denied their requests so nothing ever came from those hidden cameras what a stupid excuse i was on marijuana so i lie like i feel like that's not a side effect (laughs) i don't don't know that's just weird to me and like why lie about that and like implicate yourself into something that you probably don't want anything to do with right like why and it's obviously super fishy. Like, obviously his stories aren't matching up the story he told originally about leaving her on the beach and then the other one about convulsing. Like, I feel like, I to me, that's like the biggest sign of guilt. Like, almost like, that's ev- like to me, there should be evidence that you're lying. Like, if you're telling the truth, it's the truth. You don't have to have three different stories. Like, nobody, I feel like, who has three different stories is telling the truth. It just gets worse. Like, his web of lies gets bigger. Like, when you think about when you first, if you don't really know him which we don't but you don't get really deep into it you think oh he was a 17 year old kid when this happened and he was trying to cover his own ass by saying he dropped her off and left so it wasn't my fault what happened to her so he made it up to make to kind of protect himself so you can kind of see in the mind of a 17 year old why that would be you know something that they would do but yeah i guess but then i mean once he gets older and like he just like there's just like this shit storm of like lies and things that he does you just realize that he's just a bad person but he's not that much older like when, sorry when, how old is he when he said he was on marijuana and that's why he said that to his friend like he's still not it's not that long after is it no it was only i think it was a it was a couple of years later so i mean in his oh, okay. 2021 ish so mm. still very immature but you know yeah Um, So, yeah, throughout the years, there were various other times that things had come up that people thought could be related to Natalie. Very early on, on one of the beaches in Aruba, they had found duct tape with blonde hair stuck to it. But they tested it. That didn't match Natalie. Another time, there was a human jawbone that was discovered somewhere on Aruba. Um, That didn't match Natalie either. And so there's just all these ups and downs. Maybe it's Natalie, but then it obviously ever, turns out that it never is. Another one of the major developments happens in February of 2010. So Joran Vandersloot's father, Paulus Vandersloot, he passed away from a heart attack. And now that Joran's protection is gone, he supposedly decides to come clean and says that he'll tell lawyers where Natalie's body is for $250,000. So Beth and attorneys and FBI, they all work together to get some of this money to Yorin. So the down payment of $25,000. And then once they find the body, um, they will give him the rest. That's kind of the deal. And so they're thinking it's kind of like a win-win situation for them. Because if he is telling the truth, yes, he gets a bunch of money. You know, but then he'll probably be arrested because he actually did murder her. Yeah, well, I was going to say, did you did he ask for immunity as well? Like, was that part of the deal, too? It's like, what's the point of having all that yeah, money I don't if he's going to be then arrested? You'd think, right? So, uh, I don't know, like, what the whole deal was or how it went down. But they're kind of thinking, like, yeah, so we either we got him either way. Because then they're like, 
if he is lying, we give him this money, he can be arrested for extortion. So they feel like they got him either way. So they do send him $25,000 just as the down payment. And But somehow, like, he gets this money and he's able to get away from them. Like, he flees and he ends up going on a trip, this little vacation with all the money that he's just been given. And he is actually, he's apprehended and he was indicted with extortion and wire fraud charges eventually. Of course, because what he said about where Natalie's body was was all bullshit. So... Either whether you're just completely making it up, whether he actually does know, but he's never going to give that secret up because that would totally implicate him. Like, we don't know. That was so, a super, like, un- not well thought out plan at all on yeah. any level. Yeah, he very, he just wanted a little bit of money. Like, he was down to, like, his last $100 or something. So he needed some money to go on a vacation and party. And that's what he got. So, you know, he's very manipulative and smart, I guess, to get what he wants. But he's not going to get that money if he if they he's lying and doesn't no. lead them to it. They're not going to get. I would get he'll get the twenty five thousand, but then he'll be arrested. Like I yeah. just feel like it's not thought out. Like no, he thinks very short term. It sounds like <laughs> his plan yeah. was to get a little bit of money, go on vacation, party. That's what he did. But he wasn't thinking about well, what's going to happen after that. Um, yeah. So like I said, that was like all bullshit about where Natalie's body was, and so. Jorn went to South America, and while he was in Peru, he meets a woman named Stephanie Flores, and they were hanging out in his hotel room. And this is five years to the day that Natalie went missing. So this is May 30th of 2010. And so he's hanging out with a woman named Stephanie Flores, and she finds out that Jorn was linked to the Natalie Holloway case, that he was a suspect, and when she confronts him about it, Things got physical between them. They start fighting. So Joran strangles and he beats Stephanie in the face and eventually smothers her to death in that hotel room. So he murdered her and then he picks up his things and he just leaves. And her body was found a few days later in in that hotel room and Joran was arrested in 2012. And he was actually sentenced to 28 years in prison for that murder. So like I said, we find out that he, obviously he's very violent. He's not a good person if he's able to just, you know, just flick like that, like a switch and murder Stephanie for her bringing that up. Why did it take two years for him to get arrested if it was in his hotel room? (laughs) Yeah. um, (laughs) Like that should have been an instant thing. They find her body and then. It probably had to do with like jurisdiction, like where it was in like Peru like a different yeah maybe like place. extradition trying to find yeah. him and then like the two like authorities working together i don't know these things take a long time but I, at least they did get him and he is in prison for 28 years at this 28 point. years wow so yeah like i said at least he is in prison for this um murder but there's still no answers for what happened to natalie that's so weird though that it's literally five years to the day like that's eerie. I know it is really mm-hmm. eerie. Yeah. Like, what are the chances? Greetings. We're technically a conversation, a podcast for curious people by curious people. Every week, we take turns presenting a new topic, and the other host has no idea what the topic will be. We strive to educate in a way that's loose and fun. Our topics are all over the place, from light and funny to dark and sometimes spooky. Some of the topics we've covered include urban legends, civil rights activists, vampires, pop culture icons, the supernatural and occult, spies and espionage, science and astronomy, and other weird and random things. If any of these topics interest you, give our podcast a shot. Listen and subscribe at technicallyaconversation.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. Parental advisory. We might use strong language. One of the scenarios and theories that are out there of what they think might hap- have happened to Natalie was like a pimp scenario. And as we know throughout this story, your story has been changing a lot. And one of his stories was that he left Natalie at the beach that night. Like we said in the like we said previously. But when the police talked to the three fishermen who were there that night, said that there was no one on that beach that night. Um, they are very certain that Natalie and Yorin were not there. And another witness had come forward and said that they saw Yorin and the Kalpur brothers in a car 
not on the beach, but on a different part of the island. And in another statement, Joran goes on to say that he took Natalie to his apartment. He wanted to have a sexual relationship with her and that they were going to get a cab back to her hotel. The police talked to Joran's best friend, Freddie, and he says that it was common for Joran and his friends to get a hotel room, pick up girls at Carlos and Charlie's, and that Joran would get the American ones because he spoke English, and they would call themselves pimps. Joran also allegedly liked to videotape these events with the girls. So just from this first scenario, you can already see how much of a scumbag Joran and the Kelpo brothers were, um, which is why they were looked at as suspects for so long. As far as I can tell, there was never any recovery of those alleged tapes. Also attached to this pimp scenario is the Mr. Pink theory. And Mr. Pink is a man who worked on a beach in Aruba and he lures girls from all over the world and he promises to help them become models. He had an actual porn website. Allegedly, Joran had visited one of these websites or a couple of the websites and that could have been a link to Mr. Pink. There is some speculation that that's why he was maybe trying to connect him to sell off his videos or something. But it turns out there was like no link to between Yoren and Mr. Pink or any of the porn websites. Like they never came up with like any evidence that those two were linked. But Mr. Pink is an actual person. Is he in jail? I don't think they didn't really go in a whole lot of detail. It would, they didn't really say if he was in jail or not, but. Probably. No, I don't. I mean, or probably should but, be. I mean, yeah, but <laughs> probably. But well, it's like he, he's luring all these women, saying he could pick them be models. I mean, I feel like that's fraud. I think they're for the most part they're adults, though, so they kind of make their own decision, and it's their decision to be in a porno. So, yeah, I guess, but is it like isn't it under false pretense? Or I guess, yeah. Okay. okay maybe yeah. he, I don't know. Maybe, maybe he does take pictures of them, like modeling pictures. That, but then he's like, if you actually want to make money, like be in my porno, and so that kind of oh, thing. Okay. Um, maybe I misunderstood what Steph was saying. I thought I got the impression when she was reading it that it was like, um, like it wasn't a consensual thing. Like he lured them and then like took photos of them, like Well, maybe yeah, maybe like, lured wasn't really the appropriate word I should have used there. But like, oh. he would like he was on the or... like yeah, because he was like on the beach with like with his business or whatever and like these girls would come up to him and or he'd convince these oh, girls okay. that that he yeah could... like in he would yeah he would like convince all these girls a lot of american girls too so assuming that they came from america especially for this or maybe they were already in aruba doesn't go like into much detail but in the videos and pictures they, the locals they can clearly see the spots in aruba that he's filming them at so it's like a thing that people know about so they were never able to link Yorin with Mr. Pink like Mr. Pink said he doesn't even know who Yorin is he was never he never talked to him never bought any like videos from him or anything and the police never actually interrogated him at all so this was just okay so it wasn't like a criminal thing Mr. Pink it wasn't like a criminal operation which is okay I I got that vibe from when you were describing it so it's like okay so he shouldn't be in jail then sorry (laughs) amateur (laughs) porn yeah Yeah, from what we know anyway who knows yeah yeah. (laughs) which is totally legal so it's not like he should be in jail but yeah so um one of the other scenarios so like scenario two was um if you remember earlier we talked about the dj that was on this um that was a dj on one of the boat party boats this dj named steve who worked on a party boat in 2005 in aruba a week after natalie went missing steve voluntarily came forward as a witness and he backs up the story that natalie was dropped off at the hotel by yorin and the kelpo brothers but we know that this is a lie because the footage of the holiday inn does not have natalie on on it at all that night um he also goes on um different versions of what he was doing that night which the police started to become a little bit leery of him and they found out that he had lied about where he was the night and he was arrested for false information and was interrogated several times and was now a uh, suspect in the case um, why would he lie why would he why would he come forward with a story that was disproven already like why would he come back and support oh yeah about the holiday and when he knows yeah, that they, really there was know. no footage of that like wh- why would you want to like go with that theory when you know it's been debunked like that's weird yeah but this was just a week after natalie went missing so that wasn't public oh. knowledge that that had been debunked. Oh, okay. 
And yeah, and so when they're talking about this theory, they're kind of saying that he maybe knew Yorn or the Kalpo brothers or all of them. And so maybe they talked to him and he was just trying to help them out by being like, yeah, I saw them here get dropped off. Or he, I think there might have even been like he was in the lobby and saw her come in. So it was kind of like he was just trying to back up the story. But it's like, why would you get yourself involved if you weren't involved? And it was almost like if if he was involved, but he's like trying to deflect. So like he's like, they weren't involved. So neither was I kind of thing. So it's mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Like, just don't even say anything. You weren't on the radar, but now you are. Like he got arrested because of it. He was that DJ that got arrested. So yeah, it didn't, not a smart move. <laughs> So, um, yeah, Dumbass, so it's they all around figured, in here. <laughs> yeah. So they figured that he was lying to cover up, to cover something up, but him coming forward just made it like so much worse for himself. Um, he had access to a boat, so there was speculation that he could have been the one to dispose of her body. But as the investigation continued, Steve was cleared and no longer considered a suspect, even though he really wasn't. Like, they didn't really do an investig- like a really good investigation like into him. Um, they just didn't, I guess, have enough evidence at that time or didn't think he was that suspicious. But Yeah, he was another one of those arrest, couldn't find enough evidence to let go. Yeah, which, we see, we, which we've seen a lot in this case so far. The third scenario uh, theory that was speculated was the rapist th- uh, scenario. And a woman had come forward and said that a week before Natalie Holloway came to Aruba, she was walking the beach early in the morning by the fisherman's hut. And there was a man that was sitting there and he got up and pulled his car around and left the door open and left the car on. And he runs out to block her path of where she was walking. Um, He approaches this woman uh, naked from the waist down and was trying to assault her, but she was able to get the attention of another beachgoer so that was just like a like there could be this like really creepy man just chilling on the beach waiting for young girls to walk by or whatever alone and so she said that if Yorin and the Kelpor brothers left natalie at the fisherman hut on the beach and it's a very it's a very high possibility that this guy could have picked up natalie only nine days later the police eventually do up a sketch of the man and the woman was able to point him out in the photo lineup she then got a phone call a few days later and was told that this person was no longer in custody and that he might have fled to Colombia. so as you can imagine like they get so close to a big lead like that and then it just falls short um and they have to start all over again but i'm also curious as to why they never really charged this guy with assault because they like had him on those charges but they never kept him or charged him with anything he just was let go and then fled to columbia and they don't have access to him anymore it was later determined that this guy was already in custody on a different matter but police at the time didn't know that so when they went to go arrest him on the the assault charge he was already set free and fled and he was on a visa that expired so that might have been the reason why he went to columbia and they can't get him back because of I'm assuming extraditing reason. So just a scumbag. And I mean, it's plausible that Natalie could have been out there on the beach alone. And this guy could have been there and he could have been involved, but wouldn't have known. Yeah, because it, it was only nine days later. So yeah, and we'll never know. If he'd, this done guy... it, if he'd done it before and he was like waiting for a girl to be alone by the fisherman's hut, which apparently Natalie could have been. That could have been his opportunity, but we won't know because they... You, they let him flee and they never like followed up or questioned him again about it so scenario four really isn't a scenario but it's more of like more just mistakes made by the police in the early days so there's reports that the key card to natalie's room was used three times between 2 a.m and 4 a.m on the morning that she had gone missing so this would sort have of been like the prime time where something would have happened to her in those hours when Yorin said that he dropped her off, but he probably didn't really drop her off. Something happened in those hours, but her key card was being used during this time. And so some think that maybe whoever killed her or took her went back to her room looking for things to steal, and her roommates happened to be still out. Some speculate that maybe Yorin 
did leave her on the beach and then she woke up and went back to her room on her own and then be left and came back a couple times and then went out again and that's when something happened to her um but there was no footage of the from the hotel of her right she was on the ground floor so there was doors that would lead right out to the outside so you could open like a balcony door but it, and it would just lead right to the beach so it'd be like an actual hotel door but then like a an outside door too that still needed the key card that's what like the footage in this um episode that they were showing like that's what it kind of looked like so it was like the back door that had the key card that was being used three times so there wouldn't be any footage in the hotel lobby and in the front of the hotel and i guess they don't have footage in the back or may- because they never looked at it or something but anyway they're saying that they don't know who was using the key card but it wasn't her roommate's key card like they know it was her own key card like it wasn't just a key card to access the room so we know it wasn't like a roommate so for some whatever, whatever reason i guess everybody had their own specific key card and they know whose key card was whose so they know it was her key card but i'm going to go into more detail like so in that episode it was done by journeyman pictures and it was called exposing the truth about the natalie holloway murder mystery um yeah so like i was saying they showed that the doors lead right outside to the beach and they're saying that one of the explanations could have been that maybe Natalie's key card got swapped with one of her roommates so that her roommates could have been using her key card not knowing it was hers. Like that kind of thing could happen super easily. Yeah, that's what I was going to say too. Yeah, so maybe it was just them coming in and out using her card. But her roommates were never questioned about the key cards and so they never knew if they did get swapped or if they were going in and out at those hours. And of course the key cards got you know submitted so there's no way for them to know if they if the key cards did get swapped and the roommates were never questioned about it so we don't know those we don't know those answers to that another mistake was that the Aruban police didn't gather security footage from all the other places around town or close to the hotel that night so things like gas stations or banks and stores it took them three weeks before they went and looked for those things and by that point a lot of the footage had been erased so there was no way for them to know if maybe natalie was out somewhere like at a at a restaurant or a store or something or who was out there doing what at those hours because all the footage was gone so yeah a lot of evidence could have been potentially uncovered but now it's gone forever so there's come kind of, those are some of the big missteps that they pointed out that the police you know kind of fucked up early on in 2012 Nat- natalie holloway was legally pronounced dead by a judge even though her mother was against it um i guess there's certain times like certain like however long an investigation or a case if he they just pronounce people dead if they well her father wanted it and her i think her father wanted it, her mother didn't but then the judge ruled that ruled with the father so she was pronounced dead even though her mother didn't want it to be so that's pretty pretty tough i feel um, Why would her father want it, though? I mean, maybe just for closure. But I guess I don't know what would be what the benefit do you get? That. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking like if she's pronounced dead, then the investigation will shift from missing, kidnapped to murder, and so maybe they can. It's like a refresh. They can start looking at things or take it more seriously. That kind of thing, maybe the benefit. Um, and yeah, again, like the closure kind of thing as well. Going back to. Um... We were talking about Dr. Phil and how he was, like, talking about this case. Um, Dr. Phil went on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, and he talked about how he thought that Natalie was still alive and suggested that she be par- she was part of the sex slave market that sees as many as one to four million women and children are traded, or sold, tricked, kidnapped into sex slavery. Anyway, I don't really know, like, why he would go on that show and be like, oh, this is what I think, like... Why the fuck would die? Why? Yeah, like, yeah I don't know. why is Doctor Phil talking? He's annoying. Yeah, I don't know. Um, like, but it's just random. Like, oh, let's have Doctor Phil on. Yeah, like, to I don't talk know about why. this case randomly. But I mean, Dr. I mean, the sex slavery, the sex slavery thing could be like legitimate. Like, you know what I mean? You never know. Like, yeah. that's something I was thinking too. Like, it's possible she got kidnapped and was just sold right away into the sex mm-hmm. trade or whatever. So, I mean, Doctor Phil's not like wrong for about that or but speculating that. But like, it's just weird that he would. He, He's annoying anyway it's just like you like he goes on and say like oh i think natalie's still alive but this is what i th- this is where i think she is like like what does he have to back that up yeah like i don't know it didn't really say anything it just that was what it said and i'm just like what 
I think it's weird. I mean, maybe I didn't see the interview, so I don't know if that's what he said, or maybe he did. I just think it's weird to say, like, I think she's still alive without having anything to base it on. You can say, like, mm. she could be still alive, or this could be, you know, instead of saying, like, well, I think she's still alive. Like, we has, he has no authority or any of No. Like, he has no knowledge of anything other than what's out there in the media. So it's just weird for him to be like, I think this happened because of this. When, I don't know. Yeah. Like, there's nothing to suggest that. You can say, like, that could have happened, but to say, like, I think that happened without, I don't mm-hmm. know. That's just but I mean, I guess. But I mean, I guess we speculate on this show too a lot. So maybe who are we? <laughs> you know what I mean? True, so we're yeah. in the same boat. Who, who are we to speculate? We don't know anything. But so the last kind of kind of a theory um, incident, I guess that we're going to get into, um, happened. It started in September of 2015. So Natalie's father, of course, has never given up on finding out what happened to Natalie. And in September of 2015, he received a call from a man named Gabriel who claimed that he knows someone who claims to know a lot about Yorn and this case. And this man, he says, his name is John Ludwig. And this is the whole premise behind the docuseries called The Disappearance of Natalie Holloway, released in 2017 by the Oxygen Network. Yeah, so like I said, like, Natalie's father never gave up on her and he had hired a private investigator almost from day one to help him figure out all the evidence, figure out things and to investigate things even further. So this private investigator is also involved in this docu-series. It's like a six part, um, six episodes in this docu-series going into detail about what Gabriel and John Ludwig have to say about the case. John Ludwig became Yorn's support after his father died, and John is completely on Yorn's side throughout all of this, and John's even interviewed by Nancy Grace on her show, and when Nancy asked him if he's surprised that Yorn has pled guilty to the murder of Stephanie Flores, John just says very nonchalantly, he goes, quote, well, he really didn't have a choice in the situation. He obviously murdered her. We're just hoping for the best. Hopefully he gets out in 10 years or less. End quote. And so in the docuseries, um, The Disappearance of Natalie Holloway, there is a clip that John makes of himself watching his own interview on Nancy Grace. And you can just tell from this short little clip that John is a very disturbed person and he has like a very skewed sense of loyalty to Yorin for some reason. And while he's watching himself being questioned by Nancy Grace, he says that he had a great time in Aruba and all this was after all the Natalie stuff happened, but it was before the Stephanie murder happened. So it was like a great time in his life, he says. And he says that Stephanie provoked Yorin because she had found she had found one of the emails that had linked him to Natalie's case. And yeah, so she confronted him, but she kind of brought it on herself. And so John says, how dare she put her hands on Yorn? Because apparently she kind of like slapped him a little bit when they were fighting. And she says that she's the one that made Yorn take it to that level where he had to get that violent. And he goes on to say that she should rot in her grave for what she did to Yorn, putting him in jail. And that he, John, should piss on her grave for that. So you can just kind of see john's character and his loyalty to yorin even though yorin did something disgusting john is still on his side it's like she should apologize to him for putting him in jail versus oh he is in jail because of what he did yeah i know exactly that's 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 why he's just like very disturbed yeah so this is what gabriel had to say in may of 2016 he says that john knew Yorin by randomly meeting him one time when John was there in Aruba and he said that he recognized Yorin right away from being on TV because of all the Natalie Holloway um, coverage that was happening at the time and John kind of thinks of Yorin as a famous person and he really wanted to be friends and so they really hit it off right away and they become fast friends because of this and they were just constantly hanging out in Aruba and partying and John says that Yorin tells him that him and Natalie did go to the beach together and that she started foaming at the mouth and he tried to help her but he couldn't do anything to save her and that's when he panicked and he called his dad to help him and his dad ca- actually came and helped bury Natalie's body so this is all this is everything that John is saying 
And so Dave actually meets up with Gabriel in person to talk about John and the entire situation. And they go into further detail. And Gabriel says that he knew John for about four years before John even started opening up to him about what he knew about Natalie. So he kind of had to gain his trust. And then once he came forward, or once he started talking to Gabriel about this, Gabriel felt that he had to come forward with this information. So Gabriel implies that Yorin had given Natalie a drink with GHP in it, which is a type of date rape drug. And Yorin claims that she overdosed and that's why she was foaming at the mouth and that she choked on her own vomit and died. And because he was scared that they would find GHB in her system, if they found her, did an autopsy, that he would be in real trouble. And so he didn't want to call the police and that's why he instead decided to get rid of the body. And he called his father to help and his father actually does come and help him dispose of the body. They put her in a small burlap sack and they apparently had to like break her legs to get them to fold properly so so they could get her small enough to get into the sack and then put her in the back of his aunt's car to get to the national park where he says that they buried her and then they put a cactus over the spot. Um, So John wasn't involved in any of this, but that's allegedly what Yorin had told him. And then... Yorin allegedly tells John that he's scared that they're going to find the body and so he offers John $1,500 to go dig up her body and John actually agrees and once he finds Natalie's body in the National Park, he digs her up and Yorin's father had a connection with someone at the morgue and so now he's saying that they cremated the body and they threw all the ashes in the ocean. So the guests are saying there's really going to be no trace of her anywhere ever. But Gabriel is saying that all hope is not lost because there could still be some of Natalie's DNA in that initial grave where she was because she had been there for a little bit so she would have decomposed and maybe you know just left some of her DNA there. And so this whole documentary is them trying to get John on tape through all these hidden cameras and hotel rooms to kind of reiterate his story to Gabriel so they have it on tape. And they even bring John and Gabriel to Aruba, still like undercover, and John brings his girlfriend, Gabriel brings his girlfriend, and they're all out there kind of on vacation. But John has agreed that he will show Gabriel where he dug up Natalie's body. So that actually, he changes his story a couple times, saying that it's not in the National Park, but it's actually, you know, not that far from John's aunt's house where he got, where she was buried. But then they're saying, well, what's a coincidence? Because Yorn and John didn't know each other at this time, that Yorn would bury Natalie very close to John's aunt's house. So there's like, the things aren't matching up. But John does bring Gabriel out there with the GPS and shows him exactly where her body is buried. And then he actually talks to some of the canine um, people in the like authorities also as well, saying that that's where he buried the body. And they end up actually do finding some remains after they, they dig and a lot of people get involved. They even contact Natalie's mother, Beth, to get some DNA from her to test some of the remains that they found. Um... But of course, it turns out that it's not Natalie. And so it's almost like this whole thing, either John made it up or he kind of got suspicious and then didn't want to come clean because that would implicate him. And so this whole thing was kind of this big elaborate scheme that never actually amounted to anything. And the sad part is, is like Natalie's father, Dave, is involved the whole time. Like he feels like he is really invested and feels like this is finally going to be the answer. But in February of 2018, Natalie's mother actually filed a lawsuit against Oxygen because of the Oxygen Network because she stated in an article in the Washington Post by Kyle Swanson, she quoted, the show was not a real-time or a legitimate investigation into new leads as the program claimed to be, but it was a pre-planned farce. And Holloway claims that she was duped into providing her DNA to be tested against remains found by producers without being told that the DNA was for a television show, end quote. And so Beth feels like the whole thing was kind of staged to start with, and she's suing them for that, even though Dave Holloway was very much involved. So I don't think that he thought it was made up. Like, why would he go along with it if it was like this whole fake thing? 
maybe for publicity, maybe for money to help with the search. I don't know. But this whole thing, like, and I don't know the answer to if it actually was fake. The producers are denying that it was fake and that the whole thing, they actually did find remains and they were hoping to, you know, positively ID them as Natalie. But whether they had these remains first and then they kind of made this whole thing to be like, oh, we found her. I don't know. So the whole thing is very like, was it fake? Was it not? Either way, we're still not any further into knowing what happened to Natalie. The Oxygen Network is very legitimate. Like, that's where a lot of... <laughs> it'll bring this up again. Up and Vanish. Like, that's where a lot of... Like, they have their show there. And, like, the Up and Vanish people... Uh, like, a partnership with the Oxygen. And they do stuff together. So, I feel like they're very legit. So, I don't know if any of this is true or fake. Or oh, what. really? Because I didn't know... Because when you were talking about that, like, I thought Oxygen was kind of not legit. I don't know. I, I d- don't really know much about the network. But I thought it kind of was sort of, like... Not I don't know credible, either, but... but I mean, I know that like the Up and Vanish podcast kind of does stuff with them, so uh, I feel like they are legit, but also maybe they sensationalize things as well to get viewership. Like a lot of people, but like do. not every, and also not every show has the same producers on Oxygen, so maybe the producers of this particular documentary were not legitimate, even though the network itself is. You know what I mean? Yeah, maybe, but I mean, the people involved in this. This little docu series was like Dave, Natalie's father. It was his private investigator that had been working with him for you know almost twenty years. It was FBI agents. It was police. So everyone was involved. So I feel like how could it be fake if all those people were there? They weren't all in on it. And that how could the producers just make this up and string all these people along? Like it seems far fetched. But anyway, Natalie's mother seems to think that it was totally fake from the beginning. So I guess we'll never really know what John actually knows, if what he knows is true, if he's made things up, or if Yor did actually tell him the truth. Um, Because in 2018, John was actually stabbed to death after he attempted to kidnap a woman from her car and she fought back and killed him. So he was also not a very good person. He was, um, obviously you could tell he was a bad person, but then he actually tried to kidnap this woman and she killed him. So his secrets died with him. So we don't know his side of the story if it was real and we'll never know so that's that so the natalie holloway case is still unsolved and in 2020 15 years after natalie went missing her mother beth goes back to aruba to continue to search for her daughter abc 2020 did a documentary on the case and they talked to beth and they re-interview her and take her to aruba to try and get some more answers and try to understand what happened to her daughter after 15 years of her being missing the amount of effort that beth has gone through so heartbreaking to like see her have her hope such hopes and energy and she believes so desperately that her daughter is still alive um i just feel like i just feel so sad for her because like i believe like i still believe natalie's like i i don't believe natalie is alive um and that her body is out there somewhere i don't and i also don't buy the whole like the whole sex theory or sex trafficking theories or any of the theories that we talked about um i know that the sex trafficking things are real scary places and it does happen to a lot of women but i don't believe like i don't believe that happened to her what but what i do believe is that yoren and the kalpur brothers had something to do with her disappearance just be from the way he was acting and all the lies and just the different stories he told about the night and just how yoren fed the media like if he like, if you can come up with all these lies, then it just shows you how, like, he's hiding from the truth and he's trying to confuse the investigators and lead them down all these different alleyways that aren't even true. Like, I feel like if you're lying because you, you're you trying to cover up what you actually did, because if you actually didn't do it, then why would you lie? I was thinking, I, what Katie did say earlier, I think, could be, like, when you were saying that he is only 17, he was only 17 at the time, so I could see a scenario where, like, it was legitimately like you know she convulsed or she had a seizure or whatever she vomited and choked and died or whatever and then he's 17 and doesn't know what to do and he thinks everything's going to be blamed on him because he was the last one to see her he was the last one with her so like out of panic then he did do something to cover up so i mean he would still be guilty of like covering up a crime or like lying about it obviously that would still be guilt but like i could see a scenario where like he lied because he was afraid that he was going to be he was going to be you know implicated 
Yes. So, but, and, and then also, by lying, it made it worse. Yes. And also think of this. Like, he could be scared, doesn't know what to do. He calls his father for help. His dad comes and it's like, let's just bury her so nobody knows anything. And your dad's an attorney, going to be a judge. You're going to be like, okay, dad, like, for sure. You know what I mean? You're not going to go against him. He knows your secrets now. And if your dad is like, let's bury this dead body so no one knows about it. And you're 17. You're going to be like, okay. Like, so... I feel like that didn't help. If that's actually what happened, I feel like Jordan could tell the whole truth now and nobody would believe him. He did write a st- he did write a book about his side of the story, what actually happened. I mean, whether that's true, we'll never know. I feel like no one's going to trust him now. But if there is any truth to him calling his dad for help that night because Natalie was overdosing, whether it was something that he had given her, whether it's just because she was very drunk or on drugs, and his dad was like, well, you know, the only thing we can do is get rid of her then that's so it's so messed up and you can kind of see why you would be like yeah i gotta make something up to get me out of this and you think about it his father was arrested so there was something that was happening there that made police think that he was involved or something sketchy so yeah it's very you just don't know what actually went down i'm very intrigued by this oxygen documentary even though natalie's mother says it's a complete farce but like the f- that part about him calling his father and all that stuff you said like that's the one thing that makes it seem like it could be plausible and he's obviously going to trust and go his dad and go with what his dad is saying like you said if his dad is saying like let's just cover it up it never happened we'll never speak about it whatever obviously he's 17 he'll be like sure so i feel like that could totally be plausible and then he lied about it obviously when it came up he didn't maybe foresee that like they were going to be looking into it so quickly and that he would be looked at so quickly and then didn't think that you know the hotel footage wouldn't line up with his story so and he's only 17 so he doesn't know what to say necessarily right so i feel like that could be a possible scenario where it's not necessarily that he like took her to that beach in order to kill her but it just happened however it happened and then he covered it up which is obviously still wrong but i could see that being a scenario yeah a plausible scenario yeah he might not have been involved he may not have been involved in her death only so much that he just didn't help her or didn't know what to do and then he got rid of her body and that's obviously a a, a criminal act but yeah i still think there's something obviously yorin was involved in some way i think my opinion only but yeah whether it was directly like he planned it or it happened and then he covered it up like there's something there with yorin i don't really believe you know that mr pink theory or sex trade thing yeah i I feel like those are all red herrings but i also feel though if john ludwig was so you know invested with in yorn and believed everything and like was on his side why would he make that stuff up about yorn if it wasn't true right because he was saying oh i hope he gets he murdered stephanie but i hope he gets out of jail in 10 years it was like well he obviously has problems so i don't really know why so i'm saying why would he why would he make this stuff up about yorn being involved and burying the body if it wasn't true you know what i mean because why would he say that stuff about his best friend this guy that was his famous friend you know so is this guy even real like is he an actor i feel like if this was a fake documentary that's a farce like maybe he's just an actor pretending that he's someone who no he's like, a real th- he can tell that he's messed up i like this gabriel guy that came forward about about john was all he was his roommate and he's like i he quit the documentary so many times he's like i can't handle it with so much pressure he's like he's crazy i gotta get him out of my house he's like, you don't understand what he's like he's like an actual like crazy sociopath psychopath anyway john's dead now like i said he was stabbed so we don't know like we won't know everyone is like almost everyone is dead in this case except yorn and say it's unfortunate that like if he was arrested for natalie like for natalie's case and this poor Stephanie girl would never have been murdered because he would never have been around her. So it goes to show that, like, he is capable of murder because he murdered this woman. I know. So it's like, it's obviously, so whether the Natalie thing was a mistake or he meant to do it, but obviously we know he can kill someone. He's done it. So if he can do it then, why couldn't he have done it in 2005? Yeah, he, was, he was capable of killing her and then just kind of walking away as if nothing had happened to Stephanie. Yeah. So... Uh, it's almost like, well, I did it once, I can do it again kind of thing. And what are the chances that somebody who's like, somebody like him who has that tendency, obviously, is intertwined in this case and is completely clear, like, is completely innocent of it and has nothing to do with it? Like, what are the chances of those two things being co- coincidental? If you ever look at, like, interviews with, with Yorin or, like, just media clips of Yorin, like, you can just see, like, this, like his smug smile that he does like, annoys the hell out of me when i was watching documentaries but like just as like he thinks he knows like he thinks he's so 
manipulative and you like got like the police like office trail or whatever but like it just i don't know people like that just like you can tell they're evil from like the inside the well i always well i always i always try like i go back and forth because sometimes i'm like yeah obviously you look at somebody's demeanor that it says a lot but i feel like a lot of people can read into sort of demeanor things that what they want to see so i also feel like just because somebody has a weird creepy demeanor doesn't mean they're guilty of murder right because some people just have that vibe about them and they're completely <laughs> they're not criminals so they're just like creepy but they haven't done necessarily anything so but i think like just if you take its demeanor out of it like just looking at the facts of it like nobody lies to the police three four times it has nothing to do with it like obviously there's something he's trying to cover up at some point whether it was but, he intentionally did it or didn't yeah and there was also this other like going down another rabbit hole here that the cal polo brothers maybe it was them that had done something maybe they knew that yorn had left natalie kind of you know drunk almost passed out on the beach they dropped him off at home and then went back to the beach and found her and did something to her so there was that theory going around as well and so whether there's any there's nothing really to back that up but that was just something people were thinking of and so yeah like you were saying if they're cleared why would they ever come forward with anything else because that could just bring more suspicion onto them right so i don't blame them for staying out of it now that they're cleared yeah so do you think it's possible like also that one theory too that i'm going back to or the thing that the police were thinking of like that person who used her key card and like went in some back door like you think it could have been your and like he killed her and then stole her key card and then knew that oh there's going to be cameras at the front so i can't go in through the front so i'm going to go in through this like back door like do you think that's uh, that's like could be a possible scenario but I also feel that the person that used the key card would have to know which room was hers because they don't say the room number on the card, right? Because that would just, you know, you find a key card, you know whose room it is right away. So I feel like you'd have to know whose room it was. Yeah, that's true. So I don't know how that person that got the card, if it was Natalie told or one of her roommates. Maybe. That's what I'm saying. It wasn't some random person unless you was just checking every door. You know what I mean? yeah so yeah if that is true but uh, yeah but i don't i don't think i don't know there'd be no reason for yorn to go back to her room so yeah like why would he risk having his dna all over that room when he doesn't have to you know like he's not gonna go back to her room and like put all that dna in that room if if the crime happened outside of the room and he like there's no need for him to do that so i feel like it's probably yeah just maybe his the roommates got their keys cards mixed up you know they're all drunk and they so just used her key card in that door. I don't know. It's probably more likely. That seems like a very easy thing to figure out. But now that, you know, we have no way to know that because the key cards are all passed in, right? So you have no clue who's had which one. So, yeah. But you could ask that. You could always ask yeah. the roommates, did you come in and out between two and three, two and four in the morning? And if they're like, yeah, well, then it's like, okay, well, it was them. <laughs> like, that seems like a simple explanation. I'm surprised that they didn't ask or talk to any of the the um, friends that were, that were there or any of the chaperones that were there about Natalie. Like, if they saw, I'm her sure they did. Whatever. I'm sure they did. Do we know that they didn't? I'm sure they did a little bit, but they obviously didn't go into detail about who was going in and out of the room that night, who was using that key card. They didn't go into that kind of detail. Yeah, that's true. So they might have talked to them like superficially, but nothing actually in depth or obviously. A lot of the the kids and probably some, maybe some of the roommates would have all left on their flights that day, right? So it wasn't like they were all there. It could, it probably would have been a lot of work to track them all down, which would have been the job of the police to do. But you know, they probably didn't. So it is just one of those cases too. It's like pretty high profile, but I've, I just. And it's unsolved and will probably never be solved. And like you said, Yorin's credibility is totally gone at this point. Like he has no credibility. So even if he were to come forward and say, oh, I did it. And this is what happened. It's like, well, you tried to extort the FBI for money saying you knew. So like, I just think it doesn't matter what he says now. It's like no one's going to believe anything he ever says, whether it is the truth or not. I know. And sometimes I think like, well, he's already in jail for Stephanie's murder. Why wouldn't he just come forward if he did it? But then, of course, then he'll have those charges on top of the murder charges so he'll never get out so at least he has a little bit of hope to get out now i don't know so yeah yeah crazy case 
well, that's it for this case. Um, thanks for tuning in uh, for this case. I know it was a little bit of a longer one, but um, thank you so much. And please let us know what your theories are. Of course, we love interacting with you and knowing what you think about the cases and any theories that you have. We love to hear them. So follow us on social media at Crime Family Podcast on Instagram, at Crime Family Pod One on Twitter, and on Facebook at Crime Family Podcast. And as always, you can send us an email at Crime Family Podcast at gmail.com to send us those theories and feedback and all of that good stuff. So yeah, like I said, thank you for tuning in. Uh, <laughs> See you next time. Yeah. Bye, guys.